I thank the choir for sharing that beautiful anthem, that beautiful prayer. Thank you. God bless you. And let us also once again look to God in prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you and praise you for all the life and love that you pour out upon us in your Son and in your Spirit. We ask and pray, dear Father, now as we turn to read your word, that you would truly open our hearts and our minds, help us to be receptive to all that you would speak to us this day, that you would help us to grow in your grace and in your goodness. We thank you and make this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Today we're completing a series of sermons from the fourth chapter of Mark. And what we've discovered in these parables that Jesus has told are various images of the kingdom of God and how the kingdom is tied to these beautiful images of growing things, uh, seed and, and farmers, and, uh, and now today the, the parable of the mustard seed. And uh, it's been my hope and prayer that as we have moved into the fall season with all the new things that are happening and emerging that it would also be the beginning of a new cycle and season of growth for, for we as a church and, and also as individual Christians, that God's Spirit would continue to grow His life and His love within us in beautiful and, and wonderful ways. Now, you're probably wondering, where am I going next, right? <laughs> what I thought I would do, and I've been thinking through this, is now, listening to James and the work of the session and the things that the session has uh, covenant together to, to look at in the coming year, is I thought I would use those bullet points that the session identified as part of their yearly mission and vision and use the bullet points as the basis for sermons through, through this next month and, uh, or so. And as it's the work of the session... It also becomes our joint work as a congregation, particularly as we move into the stewardship season, to think about how we live together and share together and work together as a church. And so that's what I'm thinking of doing next. And I even think Ruth approved of that. Ruth, didn't you? Yeah, yes. So we're good. <laughs> I'm just teasing, all right? But today, the parable of the mustard seed. And and as I thought about an Old Testament text, I, I thought of Psalm 1, a beautiful picture of how we are like trees. So let's listen for God's word, Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season. Their leaves do not wither, and all that they do they prosper. Now, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And from Mark's gospel in the fourth chapter, Jesus is teaching parable of the mustard seed. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? What parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up becomes the greatest of all shrubs, puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
As we've looked at the parables of, of growing things as Jesus is describing the kingdom, uh, this parable is, is different than the parable of the sower, as we remember, because there we discovered there were impediments to the growth of the seed that the sower cast. But here there's none. The seed goes in the ground and it grows into a beautiful, beautiful big shrub. There's not even a hint of any kind of partial failure in the growth of the seed that Jesus likens to a, the kingdom to a mustard seed in a mustard bush. Now, in Jesus' time, the mustard seed evidently was proverbial for its smallness. They would say, as small as a mustard seed. We might say, as small as a minute, or as tiny as an atom, you know, something like that. It's proverbial, small as a mustard seed. And then thinking about it, this beautiful little parable is kind of like a little mustard seed of a parable. You know, just a small little word speaking about something eternal. And in some ways, the picture of the mustard seed and the mustard bush is an antidote to the thought that in our world, that bigger is better. Jesus, indeed, in his life and teaching, continually draws our attention to small things and lifts them up. A cup of cold water given in his name, a visit to a sick person, welcoming one who is a stranger. In his teaching, you leave the flock, the good shepherd leaves the flock to find the one sheep that has been lost. One writer said, we who worship at the shrine of appearances need to know the potent vitality and the strange power of the Christian idea. For everything has its beginning. Even huge things once were just ideas, hopes, thoughts, prayers. Walt Disney, when he used to talk about his great empire in his life, you know, who built this huge business, he would sometimes tell people, remember that this all started from a mouse, you know? You know, Jesus' life, in a way, is kind of like the parable of the mustard seed. You think about it. He starts out in a manger, in a stable. He certainly was sort of the smallest of all seeds, a humble person who always thought of life in terms of service and giving and loving. Jesus didn't trust himself to the crowds nor seek to create some huge thing that would follow him. He's sort of the mustard seed that is planted in the earth and the soils of human lives. And in his person, the entire church is enclosed. The mustard seed, in a way, loses its life as a mustard seed in order to become the greatest of shrubs. And Jesus' ethic, his life, his teaching points to the giving or sacrifice of self in order to see a greater result. Self-sacrifice, giving, loving, serving. That's Jesus' life. He's like the mustard seed himself and calls us into that kind of life where we also love and serve and give of ourselves. The seed grows, Jesus said, and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, a picture of development. The seed contained the promise of the tree, and that's what it became. Isn't it true that we also grow in the direction of our dreams? That what we plant in terms of our hopes, our dreams, our wishes, our prayers... That's ultimately what our lives 
start to become. And so we need to take heed to think about what it is that our, our minds are conceiving, what our dreams are starting to see, to plant those things that will produce the kind of life that, that Jesus leads us to see. For if we say plant the seeds of selfishness, then that's what will grow. And we'll end up finding ourselves disappointed. But the seeds of faith are planted and produce a different kind of fruit. And through this month, as we've talked about the seeds of faith and how they grow, we've also asked this question alongside. Is what does it look like? What does it look like? to be the mustard bush? What does it look like here, now, for our congregation, for our life together, to be the seed that's planted and begins to grow? What does it look like? And as we begin to think and reflect and dream and plan and hope about what the church can be and what the church can be doing, we're planting seeds that are very positive and filled with grace and expectation. And those will grow. God will make those things come alive in unexpected ways, in ways that we might not even have imagined ourselves. And we shouldn't be surprised to look back from the vantage of some significant thing. And remember, there was once just an idea, a prayer, a vision seed. And here in World Communion Sunday in the parable, you see the birds of the air coming to make nests in this, this beautiful shrub. And it kind of is a picture of the universality of God's kingdom. There's an openness in this life that transcends our earthbound vision of what is possible. Now, as Jesus is recorded this parable in Mark, it's also recorded in Matthew and Luke. And there's only one subtle difference in Jesus' telling of the parable recorded in Mark's gospel, and it's, it's this. Matthew, the, the birds come to make nests in its branches. And in Luke, the birds come to make nests in its branches. But here, in, in, as Mark shares how Jesus spoke it, it's the, bird, the birds come and make nests in its shade. And to me, it's just kind of a more beautiful poetic picture as Jesus describes it in this, in this instance. The shade, a poetic effect of restful repose. For the kingdom of God has its finish by being of service. This is a place where birds can come to build a nest, a place of shade. Now, if a bird is going to build its nest in its shade, it's saying that this is a place where people can make a life, where people can make a home. This is the kind of place where someone who comes as it encounters the shade of the church and the Christians within it, they say to themselves, this life that is demonstrated to me in the lives of these people and the power of the Holy Spirit is a place where I can bring my family." It's a place where I can find a friend. It's a place where I can be of service. It's a place where that which is the very best in me can be called forth so that I can give of myself and therefore grow in beautiful ways that I hadn't imagined before. That's the image of building a nest. You know, we all can find a place here to make a life to make a good life together and for each other. A place where the birds of the air can come and build a nest in its shade. Even by using the mustard seed or tree, there's still the point of humility. I mean, Jesus could have used a much larger tree, but he still uses the picture of just a really good-sized shrub, sort of a small tree. And the mustard seed, the mustard bush is an herb. So it's useful. It's a useful thing. It's not just an ornamental plant. 
I don't know how it smells. Probably smells like mustard. I don't know, you know. But you can use it. It's a mustard plant. You make mustard out of it. And from what I understand, they also use the oil that you could extract from its bark. And its uh, church's place provides shade. Now, in our culture today, what I understand is that if you cast shade, that's not a good thing, right? You cast shade, you know. Um, and I've heard that. I've heard that you, someone's throwing shade on somebody. Like, All right. <clears throat> I kind of know what that means. So I Googled, what does it mean to throw shade on somebody? And this is the definition. To throw shade is to talk trash about a friend or acquaintance, to publicly denounce or disrespect. And evidently, it's the one throwing the shade who is perceived as the uncool one. But, you know, here in Columbia, South Carolina, if someone's throwing shade, we're on board, aren't we? You know, <laughs> particularly in the summer, you know, we want a shade. Hey, we're all in on that, you know. So, uh, <coughs> you know, <coughs> excuse me. So the question becomes, how can we be those who throw the shade of Christ and people that are out there living in a parched? I didn't cough on purpose, you know, it's little parched up here, so I'm <clears throat> going to... How can we be those who cast his shade in a good way? And what does that look like? What does that look like as we think about that, dream and pray about that, how we can continue to grow and develop in this very beautiful image, to be a place of rest, a place of peace, a place for forgiveness, a place where pain is eased, and that together we cultivate the fruits of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Shall we stand and confess our faith together as we use the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Indeed, here we come into the presence of Christ, and we stand in the shadow of his cross. In his place of sacrifice and giving, we perfectly see Jesus' ethic lived out and demonstrated, for he gives himself, and in the presence of Christ, we all come to find that peace and that rest and that hope and that security that goes beyond anything we can ever imagine in this world. And so let us find our rest and peace in him as we gather together in the shade of his beautiful love. This is indeed the Lord's table and not our own. And if you profess faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then this meal is for you. And also we understand in our church that if you are a Christian family, bringing up your children in the love and grace of Christ, that it is also your choice to share the sacrament together with your children. And we will invite you to come forward and dip the bread in the cup and receive it here. <clears throat> 